Greetings, ladies and mantle gents, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales, Tales from Outer Space. 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 And as always, I hope that you enjoy. Story number one. Complete Acquisition and Utilization. Written by Ark Demon Kerensky. We had fought them for as long as we could remember. Certainly, longer than any of our living members had existed. We fought them because they were there. Because everything that exists belongs to us. Exists for our use. They disagreed, and we removed them for it. They were insignificant, as all the rest we had removed or used up. We took the first subnodes from them when we needed them. Barely any effort worth noting. We assumed that they had learned their place in things when their futile attempts to reclaim the system stopped before we had finished there. Most interlopers take a few rounds of acquisition to realize that there is nothing before us. Then they flee when we eventually encounter them again, once we are down to the core of their resource node. Sometimes, when they are contracted like that, they can slow us down in our acquisition of systems. Usually, though, it's more because they are sending so much towards us that it is simply more efficient to process those materials for our use. Eventually, we need more than they are sending, and we take those subnodes too. We have yet to encounter an interloper species outside of its origin resource node until these. We weren't sure if they developed into node travel systems, but prevailing thought is that if they did progress to that point, they had learned their place and left existence and its resource nodes to us, as is appropriate. Until these, uh, uh, but I'm getting ahead of myself. After we moved to acquire and utilize the next subnodes, we discovered why they had ceased to annoy us in their initial subnodes. They had sought to prevent our acquisition of the next subnodes. We considered it to be nothing of significance, though the detonation of the subnode core did slow down our harvesting, as everything had been scattered into constituent particles. With the benefit of consideration from nature perspective, it is now obvious that we would end up in the situation we are finding ourselves in. Before we encountered him, a resource node could be acquired and utilized in its entirety, on average, in just over three quarters of its initial rotation duration, plus or minus a quarter rotation depending on its size. Directly due to their interference, our acquisition of the entire node was pushed to one and a half rotations. Full utilization of the node took another half a rotation. This was unheard of since our origin node had been fully utilized. The next node took four and a half rotations for acquisition, two rotations to complete utilization. They had predicted where our next choice for node harvesting would be and prepared it for our arrival. The experience caused a bit of cultural renaissance for us. We had finally encountered something that caused us to change our ways. Instead of simply acquiring and utilizing a subnode as we needed resources, we had to plan for our future needs due to the new time it took to acquire and then utilize the subnode. We actually had to put effort into things, re-remembering concepts from our origin that we had put away. Devices and tools that we considered to have long ago risen beyond. They never stopped us, though. Just slowed us down, delayed us, sometimes even annoyed us. Never made us question our ownership or of existence as our right. We had acquired and completely utilized 1.44 times 10 to the power of 9, full of resource nodes, before we encountered them. 4.397 times 10 to the power of 15 was the final tally when we came to the last node. What had to be the final stand and would cement us as the owners of existence, when all would be our one. The time it took us to acquire these resources nodes staggered even us, over 10 to the power of 11 rotations on its own. The previous node hadn't even taken half that, and even we had started to consider things to be a little ridiculous at that point. That unshakable belief of ours, it had been a little shaken. But the end coming, the last of this note and the obvious final stronghold of this most obstinate of interlopers, we ignored those tremors and went forward, 
In celebration of our purpose soon to be fulfilled, we did something we had never bothered to do before. We went to a choir in person. We went to their last world. We went to their last world and there was nothing there. Nothing except one tiny building on a mineral subnode that they had flattened. Not flattened, but spheridized it, polished it smooth, left it so that we couldn't miss it, even if we had left the harvest drones to do the job. One tiny building, straight out of our own history, not just from our origin node, but from our origin subnode. Inside was a message, actually written out in hard copy, in our ancestral language. Watched live by every member. We all saw and read it together. Its contents shattered us. To our late friends, thanks for playing with us. We had lots of fun and we hope that you enjoyed all the toys and surprises we left behind for you. Uh, to be honest, we got bored a few trillion galaxies ago and ascended with the rest of our friends. I'm sure there's plenty of things that you're wanting to know now that you've got everything. And we'll be peeking in every now and then to watch the show. But, um... Uh, Whenever you get bored to, come join us a few dimensions up. Love, humanity. End of story. Story number two. Driven to Madness, written by British Tea Company. By all accounts, name redacted, was clinically insane when we first rescued him off the Dunker Q3. When we had found him, the man was almost a beast. Wearing the furs off the locals, which he had found slain and flayed. The man was marred by countless scars and wounds, heck unkept like some savage on a backwater world. The only thing that he even indicated his mind hadn't entirely snapped was the fact that for five years, this madman somehow managed to maintain and repair an Ares-class suit of power armor. Granted, repair must have been very loosely in that context, especially when said armor was barely working. An impressive feat, nonetheless. Though, I am sure the engineers would have appreciated what kind of handiwork Name Redacted had performed if they didn't have to remove a belt of Xeno skulls from the waistline. When the search team had found Name Redacted, the man was found to have been broadcasting a weak, but fortunately encrypted signal which allowed for his rescue. Recovering him was without incident, despite the misgivings of several members of the rescue team when they saw Name Redacted emerge from the woods. The way his hands curled into fists on gigantic axe that had grown chipped and worn over the years against firewood and Xeno bodies, despite most of the team expecting for some kind of bloodshed to occur, Name Redacted looked at them not saying a word before slinging his weapon over his back. The team's medic immediately inspected Name Redacted for wounds, both physical and mental. In the local vicinity, multiple gruesome effigies were found containing what was accounted to be 8,888 skulls from slain Xenos. Judging from the scattered bones and campfires, Name Redacted had likely resorted to cannibalizing local Xenos and wildlife in order to survive his trials here. Judging from the beginning of the alien occupation on Dunker Q, and the end as well as some accessing of the databases, Name Redacted had been stationed here when the invasion of the world occurred. If we had to deduce what being the last surviving human on the world could mean, even prior to the fact that it was highly likely Name Redacted had to experience loss several times against the Xeno invaders, it's doubtful that even the strongest of psychs could remain intact for long as the threat of insanity set in from the horrors of the Xeno menace. Name redacted as his psych damaged, but when we attended to him, we realized he remained unbroken. His mind was spent, but it would never break. He spoke to us about his one-man campaign against the Xenos, the loss of his friends and brothers in arms during the invasion and the horrors which he had witnessed occur to the other humans left in the world. He told us about the war he single-handedly fought against the aliens, becoming a sort of urban legend on a world as a demon that haunted the forests. The tales he spoke, the numerous attempts to hunt him down, and his means of tackling them can only reinforce our confidence that Name Redacted had somehow 
despite his actions, which would indicate an almost feral behavior, somehow managed to hold on to at least a sliver of his sanity. The witnessing of what grievous acts the alien committed against us had driven him to the brink, but it had held on to him just tight enough so that he never quite slipped. I want all documents and information about Jordan Kane to be made readily available across human space and in the rest of the galaxy. I want this information public. I want it to be visible. I want it to be everywhere. I want there to be a clear message sent to the rest of the galaxy. Just what happens when a single man is pushed over the edge. And as our peace talks with those bastards begin in a week, I want to give them an idea what would happen if mankind was pushed over the edge like this one man. End of story. The algorithm reckons you should be watching this video next, and I recommend that you should be always watching my video. So, click it, click With energy! And yes, clicking that does help the channel. Thank you very much. I would just like to give a quick thanks to the T5 channel members and patrons. Lithia, Parky, Feudic Yol, Meridian117, Cam Maxwell, Casper Arnholtz, Angry Marine, Lord Azrakal, and White Van 420 